Berlin. And uh, the topic he will talk about is uh, the historical evolution of the Somali crisis. And uh, Professor Hassanelli is well known uh, among the Somalis particularly. Uh, and he is a, a director of African Studies Center and at the University of Pennsylvania at the USA. Uh, he's author of uh, The Shaping of the Somali Society, uh, a very important book uh, uh, that has been written, I guess, in 1988, I guess. And uh, uh, he's a contributor editor uh, uh, to Dan, an international journal of Somali studies. And uh, so Casanelli, welcome. Thanks. Thanks very much to the uh, host for inviting me here. And it's good to see so many old friends I haven't seen for a long time um, from, uh, from Somalia. And it's been a long time, really. You didn't really have to provide the snow. I know it's snow. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks for seeing out of a winter at work here. I know it's been difficult for some people to get here. Um, it, it, following uh, Amina's uh, presentation, you know, historians sometimes might seem not very helpful because um, we, we, we often uh, talk about the causes of things and we can over, you know, sometimes you can overanalyze the causes or the evolution of a, of a current crisis to the point where it, it paralyzes you and you don't act on you, human, uh, human instincts. You can say, well, who, who did it? What's the cause? What's the best way to intervene? And we forget that sometimes you just have to act. Uh, so maybe it's a good maybe it's good to have an historian here at this point, but I, I want to remind you that that even though I've been an historian for 35 years, sometimes I have my doubts about the benefits of doing history or, or the benefits of of, of, of of what historians do. Um, you, you know, I, I one of the things that, that usually uh, policymakers like to ask historians to do is to give us some lessons. What lessons can we learn from studying the past? And I've discovered over all, all these years that, that the past has lessons, can teach any kind of lessons you want to, to find it there. And I think generally, most people usually use those lessons from the past that support what they already believe and what they would like to learn from the past. Uh, I think finding a, a kind of a, a neutral history that just tells the facts is, is, is really uh, not possible. So what I'm going to try to do today is just give you a few ideas or observations that have come from almost you know, more than 30 years of studying Somalia's history and to see if those might help us think about the current crisis in a little bit of a different way or at least open up the possi you know, some new possibilities, uh, allow us to think outside the box if we can. It may not work and we hope we have time for discussion. I've got a lot of suggestions you know, and ideas about uh, current, you know, ways to involve the Somali diaspora, for example, uh, in, in, in trying to generate some momentum toward peace. But we can maybe do that later. And let me just try to give you a couple of um, uh, less, uh, lessons, I guess, that I've learned uh, from, uh, from studying Somali history. Uh, excuse me. One, one thing, one, one um, question people ask is, what, kind, what is this war going on? Why is it, why is the, have the Somalis been, been fighting each other? and fighting uh, for foreigners, uh, foreign uh, occupiers, or foreign uh, interveners from, from uh, Black Hawk down uh, up to the Ethiopians. I mean, what kind of war is this? Is it a civil war? Is it a, a war against foreigners? Is it a religious war, Islamic war? And I began to, to um, think about uh, the first great Somali war of the 20th century. Some of you who know Somali history, I know the Somali uh, my, my Somali friends do, but some of you may not know. You've all heard about the Mad Mullah, Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, and his 21-year struggle against British and Italian and Ethiopian forces that were involved in trying to um, carve up and take over parts of the, the Somali uh, lands, the Somali Peninsula. And that war, we usually think about that 21-year that, that, that war from 1899 to 1920 as a, an anti-colonial war a war uh, by Somalis against foreigners. And, and Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, you know, used Somali poetry to mobilize uh, uh, Somalis uh, and, and, you know, kind of shame them for being 
submissive to the, to the foreigners and tried to, to, to rally them to his cause. He also used Islam. He was a member of the Salahiyya religious order. And he tried to use Islam to say, we can't let these infidels take over our country, right? And he was also a great uh, soldier and, and, uh, and warrior, brave, you know? Uh, and all those elements made him into kind of something of a national hero. Although, as many of you know and are quite well aware, he also antagonized a lot of Somali because many of them fought against him or on the other side. Some of them were armed by foreign factions. I mean, the British armed a number of Somali clans in the, what's today the Somali, you know, uh, Somali land, uh, in the Somali land protectorate then, to fight against Muhammad Abdullah Hassan. The Italians armed certain clans to fight against him. And he himself uh, often uh, got very much involved in local clan politics. Uh, 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 in addition, you know, some of the same areas that are involved today in the conflict, uh, the Seoul and Sanag regions, those, those are areas of important conflict. Uh, in Mudug, in Gal Gadud, where we're always having, you know, those of Somalis know, Brent Khalifa or Rajalaf, you know, always fighting. Well, that goes back to those days. So you can find the same groups of people involved on different sides during that war. So the, the, the initial Somali war of resistance against colonialism was also a civil war. And it was also a, um, a time when, um, in the name of Islam, one leader was fighting to keep foreigners out. That sounds awfully familiar. Things, of course, are very different, you know, today, but, but those elements are there. And finally, you know, even my Salim, where's Salim, is he here still? His hometown of Merca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his hometown of Merca, you know, um, uh, there's a very interesting incident that happened in 1897 where a young man from Merca came from a mosque, one of the many mosques in Marka, you know, it's a very religious town, and came and he uh, ex assassinated, he killed an Italian resident in 1897. Now, did that make Marka into a, uh, uh, you know, a, a hotbed of jihad against uh, the Italians? No, in fact, this guy who was killed, this uh, uh, Giacomo Trevis, an Italian, had actually written a very, very insightful history of the local Somalis in Marka and in that whole region based on oral interviews he'd done with the local elders. It never got published. It's one of the great documents, one of the first Italian uh, colonial authorities to try to collect some local history. And he'd been befriended by lots of people in the community there, you know, who told him, here's our history, here's our story. And then he was killed by this one guy who said, we don't want this foreigner here. Now, that's, doesn't that sound like a little bit what's going on today? I mean, we try to characterize a whole society by the actions of one or two individuals who have legit, you know, have different opinions about whether or not foreigners ought to be there and how they should be there. And so that, that, that whole episode, I could spend more time talking about this, but I, I don't want to give you a, a history lesson, which you, you, know, you don't really need at this point. But I, it reminded me that, that as many things as have changed, uh, there, are certain, uh, there are certain kinds of patterns uh, that uh, you can find by looking at, at history um, uh, closely. And one of those is a very important lesson to our international friends who, who want to help Somalia, but may not always realize that, that whenever foreigners arrive, uh, uh, they always seem to, uh, in a sense, benefit one side more than another. The way Somalis see things is that no matter how neutral or how uh, balanced an outside uh, force, whether it's Operation Restore Hope in the time of uh, the older Bush, or uh, NGOs today, uh, or various uh, foreign forces uh, that are trying to help the TFG, uh, they're always perceived in local terms as giving an advantage to somebody. They may not intend that, but you know, they end up uh, renting uh, houses from one particular clan, one family, their security forces, their drivers, their, the way they see the world tends to be through the eyes of one or another group. And so the, the, way, the way I think other Somalis would see it is this foreign intervention, this foreign presence is going to give these guys an advantage over us. Uh, and I think that's a kind of a constant in the history. I can find lots of examples of this uh, throughout uh, the, the, the 20th century history of Somalia. So one of our challenges is to find ways in which uh, being present as, uh, uh, as a humanitarian organization, as a, as a donor uh, in Somalia, uh, can be genuinely neutral. Is it possible to do that? I'm not sure, because it, it, it's one of the things that really we have to, to kind of think about. What can outsiders do 
that would benefit or seek to benefit not just one party,